but specifically in Joshua and in Jonah, are about it's a profound meditation. And this is really remarkable if you, if you think about it. This is, this is Israelite literature, but this is highly self-aware li literature. Um, we're like way, way far removed from like nationalist propaganda or something like this. This is the literature of a people group that truly believes that they are, have been chosen by the God of the universe <laughs> to be the vehicle of heavenly blessing to all the nations of the earth. That's a fairly tall claim to assert uh, about one's own people group. But yet within these same texts that tell that story and make that claim is this deep degree of self-critical awareness that, that God's own covenant people are more often than not the primary obstacle to God's purposes in the world. And that surprisingly, it's those who you assume are outside of covenant relationship with Yahweh who are actually the most spiritually attuned to what God is actually up to in the world. And it seems to me that this is a really important insight that the biblical authors want us to think about a lot because you can find this theme through all, riddled through all of the books of the Hebrew Bible. And that is why we love Tim Mackey. That was awesome. That's from a new teaching that he just gave at a Hebrew Bible conference in Portland that I attended. Hope you guys are doing great. Welcome to another episode of Ring Them Bells. You're going to love it. This is the start of a mini docu-series that's going to be focused on Tim Mackey um, and some origin stories of, of where he came from and some of his influences. So people don't just appear out of thin air as scholars or geniuses, right? They have a lot of development and paths and people that help shape them and mold them that got them there. And those were questions that I always asked about Tim Mackey, one of my big heroes, and, and I'm assuming one of your big heroes too, if you're watching this. How did he get to be who he is? You want to find out who's someone, in, is their teachers, who's their influence, who is the person that helped shape or mold them? And I wanted to find that for Tim Mackey. And I found that in Ray Lubeck. My discovery of Ray Lubeck first came from Tim while I was listening to some of his Exploring My Strange Bible podcast or even the Bible Project podcast. He mentions him multiple times. He has a whole animated video that's dedicated to Ray Lubeck. Um, so I kept hearing this name. I was like, man, I need to check this guy out. So Tim one time talked about his book, Read the Bible for a Change. We're going to talk about this more. This is the second edition. Um, the first edition that Tim talked about, I bought it right away. It was revolutionary for me. It was a game changer. It helped me approach the Bible on its own terms. To be able to go to the text and hear what the intended author was uh, giving out to their intended audience. Not coming to the Bible with my own presuppositions and my own questions. Um, lots of people talk about that. But Ray and his book, Read the Bible for a Change, what he gave, gives us all who maybe aren't in seminary or Bible colleges, practical tools to be able to approach the scriptures on its own terms. I cannot recommend this book enough. It is incredible. This is a second edition, and that's how I discovered Ray. Uh, Tim talked about this book. Anytime Tim talks about a book, I grab it right away and started reading it, and became um, this became a, just a tool for me. It stays on my uh, reading chair nightstand as I'm reading through scripture. I can pick this thing up, and it gives me such... Great tools to be able to, again, harness the intended truth, approaching the Bible on its own terms. So check it out. We're going to talk about it more. Uh, my Bible Project pilgrimage that I just got back from. So I went on a Bible Project pilgrimage to Portland uh, to see Tim Mackey at this Hebrew Bible conference. But also I wanted to investigate what's going on in Portland. Guys, there's so many authors. I could pull six books from behind me right now. John Mark Comer. Uh, Tyler Stack, Carmen Imes, uh, Ray Lubeck, Tim Mackey, so many uh, important scholars of our time right now are either from Portland or have some type of connection to Portland. So I went there like kind of like on an investigative journey to figure out what's going on here. What What is it that's happening that makes this place so special to produce uh, these things? To kind of uh, understand that, we need to understand the climate of most Bible colleges. So I have a Bible major degree. I graduated from Clearwater Christian College uh, down here in Tampa, Florida. And I have a lot of experience with Bible colleges, both through myself, professors, friends. And I can tell you the climate of most, most Bible colleges in America is an evangelical, fundamental, modern, Western way of approaching the Bible. And it's a very narrow tunnel with blinders on 
uh, at most of these colleges. That was my experience. Um, and I, from my investigation, um, from talking to a lot of people, including Ray at Multnomah, that's how it was there as well. How did we get Tim? How did we get Tim Mackey, this amazing free thinker, this great scholar that challenges, that seemingly challenges all these Western fundamental ideals that we were all kind of, you know, put the, the blinders on with? How did we get this guy? How do we have that climate inside most Bible colleges, including Multnomah? And how do we get the product of Tim Mackey and the Bible Project and all that we love? Well, I'm here to present to you that the answer, one of them, the main, is Ray Lubeck. Uh, from my interview with him, from this Bible conference that was held in his honor and all these top scholars coming to honor him, it became very clear to me that this man has an incredible story to share with us that can not only teach us where Tim Mackey came from, but can also teach us how we can take our next steps forward into this world. Biblical way of thinking, following Jesus. How do we get there? So I want to set the stage. So I've got three videos that are, that are going to be released. The first one is the one you're watching right now, so welcome. You already saw a little bit of Tim's new teaching, and we're going to bring more of that here in just a few seconds. You're going to get the whole teaching uh, that Tim just gave uh, on the book of Jonah. It teaches us again and again uh, how the Bible shows us that the enemy typically attacks from within, and God uses those that we normally see on the outside to bring about his purposes and his, his, uh, his ways. So I'll let you hear that. That's coming up soon. That's this first video. I wanted it to stand alone because it's the newest Tim Mackey teaching and sermon that we have available, and I know you guys will love it. So uh, the second video that I'm going to put out is just over the Hebrew Bible Conference. I was there uh, at Multnomah University, and it was eight hours of just a flood of knowledge about the Hebrew Bible, but then also of a love for Ray Lubeck. This uh, Bible conference was actually put together by a lot of his former students who are now top scholars um, in, in the biblical world. And what they did was they wanted to come back and honor him. Ray's not retiring, he's not leaving him, they're not forcing him out, but they wanted to take the moment and honor this man. So how they did it was they got together and they pulled together and each of these top scholars wrote a paper. Um, and in the scholarly world, when you wanna put some new ideas out, when you've really, you know, when you got something that's come across your plate in your studies and you're like, wow, and you, you have this idea or thought, you put it together and out into the public by writing a paper. So all these top scholars, what they did was that have gone to Multnomah and, and studied under Ray, they got together and they said, we want to honor him. Let's come together, let's put some papers together, and let's have this conference where we all come present it um, in, in honor of the Hebrew Bible that Ray loved. Put a lot of focus on that, on the beauty and the complexity of the structure uh, within the, the original writing um, of this, this great book that we call the Bible. So I want to share that as a standalone video because I've got so many great clips, so much great information. I think it's going to help paint this picture of like I'm telling you, like what's going on in Portland? How did we get Tim Mackey? How, how did all this happen? Uh, Ray Lubeck and Multnomah and this Hebrew Bible conference are going to reveal a lot for us. They did for me and that's what I want to share this story with you. Um, so the third is going to be my interview with Ray, and it is the cherry on top. It is everything you're going to want and more. I expected to go into this interview and to talk to Ray about the Bible a lot, which we did. But in all reality, it got into story and to, to his story about his journey through Multnomah and how we have the situation that we have in Portland today. I think you'll get some answers from my interview with Ray. So stay tuned. Uh, we've got that coming third release. So that's a lot to say. Buckle up. This is a journey. This is going to be a, a, a story that's going to be told about not just Tim, but the, the city of Portland, uh, Bible colleges everywhere, and what God's doing here in the world, in America, and what he's doing in Portland. So buckle up, sit back. We've got a great show for you. Check this out. Then, of course, it's been said, but I also just want to use uh, just my op opening words to acknowledge what... Um, what a special moment this is. There are moments in life where uh, you just have this sense th that the experience is overloaded, oversaturated with meaning. And uh, that's how I'm experiencing today. Um, and so there are many of you who are here, and you're here because you have been impacted by the work 
of someone who sat in Ray's classes, but you actually have never yourself taken a class with Ray. Um, and so that's amazing to think about, and you're having an experience of today. Um, but then there's a whole bunch of us who have had the opportunity to sit in classes with Ray, and we're having the experience you're having, and a whole other kind of experience <laughs> uh, as well that's both a reunion and then a moment to just reflect um, on the gift that was given to us uh, through a glorious image of God named Ray, Ray Lubeck. And it's such an honor to be here and to celebrate. And I know, even though you're not physically squirming, you may be <laughs> inside. Um, but I just, um, Ray, what we encountered in your classes was, was something really special. Um, so special that it drove, h how many? We, like, it, we should get a count of how many people went on to dedicate years of their lives to the labor of learning ancient languages <laughs> and suffering through the labor of grad school uh, because a fire got lit inside of us. Um, and you passed that torch to so many, all the presenters today and, and many, many more. So just, I know you're human, Tamara really knows that you're human. <laughs> um, but uh, it just s the memories and the impact of sitting in your classes um, w was a gift of God's spirit that is birthing new seed and new life uh, still today. And there's just many of us who are here, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing if it wasn't for the encounter we had with Jesus through scripture by sitting in your classes. So thank you, Ray, for that gift. <laughs> um, my uh, presentation is about Jonah, because how could it not be? <laughs> uh, the first class that uh, I had uh, the opportunity to take with Ray was Bible Study Methods, How to Read Biblical Literature. Uh, and as you know, it was building the skill set for how to read uh, biblical narrative, biblical poetry. Um, and one of the most introductory skills, I was surely within the first half a dozen classes, was the most basic skill that to me has become the most valuable skill that just keeps on giving. Uh, and that's at the core of, uh, and I've developed my language for how to talk about it, but at, at its core, it's, it's Look at the thing. <laughs> Professor Agassiz and the fish, anybody? Do you remember the parable? Look at it, go to sleep, look at it again, uh, and then again, and then again. And notice things that repeat. Um, so my presentation is titled, Chosen One or Traitor, uh, Jonah uh, Achan, that's how you say his name in Hebrew, and um, not Achan, Achan. Uh, and narrative analogy in the Hebrew Bible. My friends, you don't even have to have taken ever a class uh, on how to study the Bible to realize uh, when you're reading the story of Jonah, you're reading something akin uh, to what we might call a takedown piece uh, in our culture today. So the story of Jonah is a, a, a highly satirical and critical portrait of uh, a stubborn Israelite prophet whose name means dove, Yonah means dove. And one of the uh, most consistent tools that the narrator uses to deepen the portrait of the stubborn prophet um, is character contrast, specifically with two groups of non-Israelites, the sailors in chapter one, the Ninevites uh, in chapter three. And uh, what I wanna do is focus in on a set of character contrasts in uh, this, this uh, the storm scene with the sailors in chapter one. Uh, this scene is full of ironies, and the more you stare at it, the more it just keeps on making you laugh. For example, uh, sailors, who, you know, aren't the most savory crowd in most cultures that you go into, but sailors um, are able to discern in the storm that comes upon them uh, on the ship that uh, there are divine powers at work behind the storm. So much so that they're screaming and yelling out to um, their gods. Well, Jonah, God's chosen one, um, decides this is the perfect time to go take a nap, <laughs> right? Right, and you laugh because it's funny and you're supposed to. Um, Jonah en only ends up calling on his god, like the sailors, uh, because the captain hunts him down 
uh, and compels him to pray to his God. And this creates the deep irony that you have a pagan sailor telling an Israelite whose people only exist because their God rescued them at sea from the waters, right? This, the, the Sea of Reeds. And he has to be reminded of this to pray for a sea rescue. Are you guys with me? Okay. So um, the sailors' terror and fear at the divine power behind the storm is emphasized no less than three times. They uh, feared, um, the men were greatly afraid, and then they feared a great fear. They feared a great fear three times. And this is in contrast to what Jonah claims to have, which is, he says, I'm a Hebrew and I fear Yahweh, the God who made, right, the sea and the dry land. And of course, you're just like, no, you don't. <laughs> um, uh, nobody who fears Yahweh would try to run, run away from Yahweh by getting on a boat, no less. <laughs> and again, the, the, it, that's the whole point, is that, is that we laugh. So um, there are many, many examples, and you, you can read all the commentaries, and they all observe. It's just right there on the surface, low-hanging fruit that Jonah is being contrasted with the sailors and that that contrast is actually deepening if you're, if you're willing to stare at the thing and meditate on those contrasts. The portrait of Jonah becomes multicolor 3D, um, much more deep than if you were just to read it you know, on one time and think that you get what the story is all about. So what I want to uh, concentrate on is this technique it's a technique that I learned from Ray, and then it's a technique uh, the biblical authors are constantly drawing upon, and it's just the gift that keeps on giving. And I keep uh, uh, rediscovering how important this tool is, and I just want to focus on it. It's fairly simple. I, you might be really underwhelmed by what I'm about to share after the quality of this morning's uh, presentations, but nonetheless, this is my, my humble offering. Under promise, over deliver, you know, that kind of thing. All right. <laughs> Um, so uh, the strategy that the narrator works is very simple. The word fear is used four times in uh, the storm scene. Three times of the sailors. They were afraid. They feared a great fear. They feared a great fear. This sets you up so that the repetition of the word fear, when you hear the word come out of Jonah's mouth, notice that it's the narrator who says the sailors are truly afraid. But the narrator doesn't say that Jonah's afraid. It's actually Jonah that claims for himself. And you're already suspect of his integrity as a character because of what he's done so far. So do, do you guys get the technique? It's the repetition that makes you think, oh, those guys fear God. This guy says he fears God, but I'm pretty sure that he doesn't. Did you guys get it? Okay, there you go. That's it. You got it. <laughs> That's how it works. So just rinse and repeat. Just like do this and you will begin to experience the kind of sophistication of character portraits um, that the Hebrew Bible really offers if you're willing to stare at the thing over and over and over again. Um, what I would like to do is offer uh, my observations of a set of character contrasts that to my knowledge hasn't been noticed by anything that I've read, and of course I've become obsessed with Jonah. Uh, I'm not sure my stack of Jonah commentaries rivals yours yet, but it might. I'm not sure. But um, So thank you for this obsession with, uh, with the book. So these kinds of character contrasts um, in uh, the last half century of scholarly literature on literary analysis of biblical narratives, one of the names that these types of contrasts or comparisons have been called is narrative analogy. And the, the basic tool is fairly simple. The narrator will use key words and images in one particular story to contrast one place with another place, one thing with another thing, uh, to compare one person with another person. And as you notice, the, the repeated words are the invitation to hold the two things and to compare and to meditate on them. M this one's fairly easy to... Um, know that you're supposed to compare them because it's in the same exact scene, like it's in the same exact paragraph. But the biblical authors uh, were not limited to using this technique to just compare and contrast things within the same exact scene, the same poem, or even the same story. Biblical authors are also doing the same thing when they set two stories next to each other. Biblical authors are also doing using the same technique when they link together character places or stories that are on separate scrolls in the biblical collection. 
And what's interesting is that the terminology for uh, these sets of comparisons, when they're on different chapters or different scrolls, we use the words intertextuality, inner biblical allusion, um, or hyperlink. Um, whichever term you want to choose, we're just describing the same exact thing. Repeated words and images that call one story or poem to mind and you're meant to upload both of them, click on the hyperlink, so to speak, upload, upload both in your minds, and then meditate biblical style, which is not to empty your mind, but to focus your mind on meditating on, the, on uh, the two stories as if they're side by side. How are you guys doing? Uh, you're probably not learning anything right now, but it's just good to be reminded of the fundamentals because stare at the thing again one more time. So um, the reservoir of potential analogies um, for c character comparison and contrast span the entire biblical collection. And biblical authors are constantly doing this pervasively. Uh, let me illustrate a more complex example of narrative analogy. And again, this is, uh, many people have noticed this before me. The second line of Jonah, when God says to Jonah, go to Nineveh, that great city, call out against it because their evil has risen up before me. This is a more complex example of narrative analogy. Uh, the precise wording of God's words to Jonah in verse 2 actually comes from two places in the Torah, but those two places in the Torah are themselves hyperlinked through narrative analogies through a whole network of texts. Beginning with the story of Cain and Abel, we hear about the blood of Abel crying out to the ground, and God hears the cry. The flood story begins with God saying, the end of all flesh has come before me, Baal Ephenai. In the city of, uh, story of Sodom and Gomorrah, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah, it's very great, its sin is heavy. I will go down and see if its outcry, Tzaka, has come to me, if that's what they have done totally. The Israelites suffering in Egypt, and they cried out, and their outcry rose up to God from their slavery. How are you guys doing? So this is a ne network of narrative analogies. Each one down the chain is activating the, some previous narrative analogy from earlier in the, in the Torah. And so what the reader, the, the, the process the reader is asked, being asked to undergo is to compare Pharaoh, just starting at the bottom, compare Pharaoh and what he's doing, the evil that he's perpetrating and the outcry that he's causing to the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah, so that Egypt is like a new Sodom and Gomorrah. But Sodom and Gomorrah is like a new generation of the flood. And the generation of the flood is the culmination of the violence begun with Cain and Abel. You guys tracking with me? This is how it works. And so notice the, the, the narrator of Jonah begins the book of Jonah by just citing two links of the chain. But in reality, what you're being asked to do is recall something you're supposed to already know, which is all of the links in the chain. And so you won't be surprised that later in Jonah, you will have other narrative analogies that compare Nineveh to Sodom and Gomorrah, even though the Sodom and Gomorrah text wasn't the one hyperlinked you know, verbatim in the opening line. You guys tracking with me? So this, is, so this is what you call the work of ninja masters. Um, and you're just supposed to know um, because I th the ideal readers and the, Id and, and the actual communities that produce these biblical texts guided by God's Spirit were ninja nerds, literary ninja nerds. And, they, and it's not just because they thought literary art is cool. It's, it's exactly what Andy was sharing this morning. It's because God's Spirit guided these authors out of a context in which it's a way of seeing reality and a way of seeing the world, and the texts are an, an instantiation of a way of understanding the divine purpose at work in the world. To notice patterns in these texts is training us to notice patterns in our own lives as well, as we attempt to discern the divine purpose in our day too. So what I'd like to do with the brief time that I have left is show you one other narrative analogy that I haven't heard anyone else talk about but I am certain it's what's going on, and I could be wrong, but I don't think that I am. <coughs> in Jonah chapter 1, verse 7, uh, the sailors say to each other, Come, let us cause lots to fall down, Napira Gororot, so we can know on whose account this evil, evil referring to the storm, uh, on whose account this evil is to us. And so they cause lots to fall down, and the lot fell upon Dove, Yonah. 
So uh, this type of story where there's some disaster either present or looming and there is some lot casting ritual in order to discover the culprit um, yes, this was a practice that was common in the ancient Near East, also in ancient Israel. Um, but that doesn't explain why this particular way of finding a culprit for a disaster that's either present or is about to happen, why it happens not everywhere in the Hebrew Bible. In fact, it happens precisely five times. And as you meditate on each of these five times, these are not the f only five times that casting lots happens. There's Esther and Purim. There's the division of the promised land in Joshua. But where there's a disaster looming or about to happen or, or present and the culprit is somehow surfaced uh, through lot casting, well, it actually just happens these five times. And very similar to the stories of the outcry, these uh, five stories are riddled with hyperlinking vocabulary. They're inviting the reader to make a whole series of narrative analogies. Shall we? Let us. Let us. Uh, actually, and actually, we can't do all of them. Actually, I just said, shall we? No, it's not what we're going to do. What we're going to do? <laughs> we're just going to focus on one: uh, the discovery of Achan. In the paper, uh, I also include uh, the selection of the goat of sin on the Day of Atonement. But I am certain that um, there's not going to be time for that another day. Another day. I want to meditate uh, just for a few minutes on the story of Achan, Achan's treachery uh, in Joshua chapter 6, 7, and 8, and then show how that's relevant for an aspect of Jonah's character um, that's un uniquely uh, connected to this uh, narrative, narrative analogy. The story of Joshua chapter 6 through 8, it's a, it's a triad of literary units. It's the victory at Jericho. Then they go to the city of Ai, the Israelites go to Ai, and there's a defeat. Then they resolve the problem, and then there's a victory again. Victory, defeat, victory. Yeah? Anybody? So it's a nice little triad, little symmetrical thing of awesomeness. Um, the in the story of the victory, right, uh, at Jericho, there's a speech that Joshua gives before uh, the Israelites uh, are to march around the city for uh, the seventh time on the seventh day. And what he says is the city and everything that's in it is to be devoted to Yahweh. Only Rahav, the prostitute, and all who are with her in the house will live because she hid the messengers whom we sent. That was back in Joshua chapter 2. Joshua says, as for y'all, keep away from the things devoted to destruction so that you don't take them and bring about your own destruction, making the camp of Israel an object for destruction, bringing trouble, achar, upon it. But all the silver and gold and autumn's items of bronze and iron, holy to Yahweh, they must go into the treasury. So notice here you have an enemy city. You have the Israelites and they can see the enemy. It's outside. The enemy is out there. But then what's interesting about the enemy out there is within the enemy out there, there is one who is actually a friendly or an insider, that's namely Rachav and the prostitute. And she is to be saved from the enemy without and brought within. You guys tracking with me? So the outsider actually becomes the insider because of her faithfulness to Yahweh, which was to rescue um, the spies when they entered into the city. But Joshua warns, because we, being the covenant insiders, risk making ourselves the enemy outsiders if we take from the devoted things and bring achar, trouble upon the people of Israel. Perish the thought that, <laughs> that anybody uh, would do that. And of course, that's precisely what happens. The Israelites, chapter 7, verse 1, broke faith concerning the devoted things, and Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerach, of the tribe of Judah, troublemakers, he took from the devoted things, and Yahweh's anger was kindled against the Israelites. So, notice we have an enemy outsider, Rahav, and all who are with her, who are actually becoming the covenant insiders. And now we have a covenant insider who is making themselves a covenant outsider. You guys tracking? Yep. So the enemy without becomes the enemy within. So what's interesting about uh, what happens next in the story is that when Joshua confronts Achan, um, here's what God says uh, to Joshua. Yahweh says, stand up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel sinned and transgressed by covenant that I commanded. They have taken the devoted things. They have stolen, acted treacherously, and put them among their kelim. Just tuck that away. They've put, 
the devoted things that are the sign of destruction among the Kalim. In the morning, this is what God says to Joshua, come forward tribe by tribe. And the tribe that Yahweh captures will be brought forward by clans. We're describing here a casting of lots ceremony. But what's interesting is the vocabulary chosen to talk about this um, selection by lot is not the phrase used in Jonah, let us make lots fall down. It's to capture, to capture by means of the lot, lachad. It, it's said three times over. The capture of the clans, the capture of a family, then the capture of the one. And that one that is captured is to be burned with fire, he and all that belongs to him. So it's really uh, remarkable in the story that follows is when um, Achan gets surfaced, all of a sudden you notice something. Here in the left column, it's the, uh, the narration of the defeat of Jericho. And what you're told is that the people charged into Jericho, ahead into the city, and what did they do to it? They captured it, Lachad. Joshua said to the two men who spied on the land, hey, go to that prostitute's house and bring her out, the woman and all who belong to her, just as you swore. The young men who were spies went out, they brought out Rahav and what's all that belongs to her, her father, her mother, her brothers, all with her. Then they burned the city with fire and all that was in it. They put only the items of silver and gold and copper and iron into the treasury. You guys tracking? That's how you deal with the enemy without. We'll accept for that one who's actually not the enemy without. She's the insider on the out who becomes the insider within. You guys tracking? Yeah? Okay. Here in Joshua chapter 7, an insider has made themselves not just an outsider, but an enemy of Yahweh. And what are they to do with that one? They do to Achan exactly what they did to Jericho in exactly the same language. God says, there are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You'll be unable to stand before your enemies until you get rid. You've got to get rid of the devoted things. In the morning that you come forward, capture, capture, capture by lot, the one captured is to be burned with fire. Yeah? exactly what happened to the city. Who will be burned with fire? He and all that belong with him. Do you guys get it? Yeah. So in other words, in Joshua 6, the enemy city is captured and burned with fire, but one enemy outsider is to be spared, namely Rahav and all who are with her. In Joshua 7, an Israelite who's made themselves the enemy within by betraying Yahweh is selected and captured and burned with fire and all who are with him. Joshua, excuse me, Achan has become the enemy city, an enemy citadel within Israel itself. So what this story is doing is, it's very easy, and this is an experience many people have, the first time that they read through the story of Joshua, is they assume God is pro-Israel and anti-Canaanite. Well, except for the Canaanites who become part of the covenant people, and except for the Israelites who be make themselves into God's enemy, and then you're like, well, I guess, Everything's off now. Really what matters is how one responds to the word and instruction of Yahweh and how each person responds to the word and instruction of Yahweh which determines one's covenant relationship to Yahweh. Joshua 6 and 7. How you guys doing? Okay. We are now in a position to back up and come back to the story of Jonah. And you will begin to notice some things that perhaps you wouldn't have noticed before. Joshua chapter 7, the story of Achan, begins with telling us that Yahweh's anger burned against Israel, Vayichar Af, and they're defeated by the soldiers of Ai. This is on the left column. And this causes the Israelites' hearts to melt and become like the water. So anger reduces things to water. Interestingly, uh, the storm scene in Jonah begins by telling us that Yahweh sends a great wind against the sea waters so that the waters become angry, za'af, they rage with anger, angry waters, threatening everyone on the ship. Here on the left-hand column, in the green, Achan takes the plunder, and what does he do with it? Do you remember? He says he, he hid it, and where did he hid it? He hid it among his kalim, among his, his cargo, his belongings, or the baggage in his tent. What is it that Jonah did the moment he gets onto the ship? He goes and he hides himself below deck. And what, and where do you, <laughs> what do you keep below deck on a, on a merchant vessel? The kalim, 
the Kaleem, the cargo, so much so that this is exactly what they're throwing, throwing off of the ship, yep. So eventually, Jonah gets treated like the banned cargo. You guys, track, you guys get it? Yeah, you gotta get rid of that, those banned Kaleem, uh, including the enemy within. Uh, in, uh, there's a lot casting ceremony uh, to both, and the lot falls on the troubler, the one who has brought trouble, uh, Achan, son of Carmi. So also on the ship, there is a lot casting ceremony, and the lot falls on Yonah, the son of Amitai. Achan, uh, son of Carmi, is Achan, son of my vineyard. Yonah, son of Amitai, is Yonah, son of my faithfulness. Not. <coughs> Chapter 7. Chapter 7, Joshua's comfort. This is, this is the gimme. This is great, you guys. Joshua's confrontation with Achan. Joshua says, tell me, please. Haged What have you done? Ma asita. And Achan says, well, according to this I have done. Kazot asiti. The sailor, the captain, comes to Jonah and asks, tell us, please. Hagid What is this that you have done? Ma zot asita. Because he knew he was fleeing from Yahweh, because he told them, he gid lahem. Do you get it? Come on, that's good. Now, um, let the reader understand this. Both of these are themselves being set on narrative analogy to um, the Garden of Eden story. This is precisely the language God uses when he confronts Adam and Eve when they've taken from the tree, but that would be a whole other presentation. <clears throat> the story ends with a measure for measure consequence. Achan took from the plunder. And so he is treated like plunder that is taken from the enemy city. Jonah brought the dangerous waters on the ship, and so he is cast into those dangerous waters himself. You guys tracking? Okay. So once again, the skill set is exactly the same. When you look at one paragraph, and you see they feared, they feared, they fear. This guy says he fears. Nah, -uh, nah. -uh. Okay. And all the, but that nah -uh is not explicit in the text. It's a space that is created, to use Andy's imagery, it's a space that's created by two things brought into relationship. And then all of a sudden, you're left to sit with this portrait of a character whose words and actions do not match the words and actions of these others. And all of a sudden, what was a 2D story that is most often made into children's literature becomes a full multicolor 3D portrait. You guys tracking with me? The same exact technique is happening, except this time, the, set of the narrative analogies that are at work are on totally different scrolls within the Tanakh. You have Yonah and the prophets, and then you have Joshua and the, in, uh, the former prophets themselves being all mapped on, back onto Adam and Eve uh, in, in the Torah. And what, what are all of these analogies about? These analogies in, in the Garden of Eden story, but specifically in Joshua and in Jonah, are about, it's a profound meditation and this is really remarkable if you, if you think about it. Th this, is, this is Israelite literature, but this is highly self-aware li literature. Um, we're like way, way far removed from like nationalist propaganda or something like this. This is the literature of a people group that truly believes that they are, have been chosen by the God of the universe <laughs> to be the vehicle of heavenly blessing to all the nations of the earth. That's a fairly tall claim to assert uh, about one's own people group. But yet within these same texts that tell that story and make that claim is this deep degree of self-critical awareness that, that God's own covenant people are more often than not the primary obstacle to God's purposes in the world. And that surprisingly, it's those who you assume are outside of covenant relationship with Yahweh who are actually the most spiritually attuned to what God is actually up to in the world. And it seems to me that this is a really important insight that the biblical authors want us to think about a lot because you can find this theme through all, riddled through all of the books of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and I've, this set of narrative analogies is just one instantiation of, of those themes. Were we to meditate on all of the t lot casting texts, this is the basic idea of what's happening uh, in, in all of them. What else is the Day of Atonement about is that the Eden presence has taken up uh, space in the midst of God's own people, and yet they are the ones who are constantly vandalizing God's space in, in their midst, the enemy within, and Saul and Jonathan and so on, but time does not permit. Um, now this is a fairly sophisticated set of operations. 
to be, you have to know these texts really well. That's why this is literature for a lifetime. Uh, but for those of you who are at, no matter where you're at in your journey of learning how to read and meditate on biblical texts, I want to encourage you that a 20-year-old <laughs> who uh, had been following Jesus a year finds themselves sitting in Ray's class for the first time. I've never, I don't know anything about this stuff. And yet, within a semester, I had tools that I could put to work to begin to have my own profound discoveries of what's happening uh, in these texts so that I am, am having as a 20-year-old man, a <laughs> uh, young man who's surrounded by a whole college of people who are all studying scripture together, who are all learning to follow Jesus together, who were all, at that time, going to chapel multiple times a week and worshiping Jesus together. And in that environment, it was precisely these tools that became a vehicle for, for scripture to speak the voice of God into my life. And that is really what this is all about because God have mercy on us if we ourselves become uh, the enemy within. And he does have mercy on us, doesn't he? <laughs> um, and by that mercy, we believe uh, that God's blessing will go out to the nations despite our successes or our failures. Thank you very much. Tim Mackey, thank you. We have a couple of questions for him as they start flooding in. Uh, the first question, is there any New Testament hyperlink from Echan and Jonah that we can identify perhaps the insider turned outsider idea or opposite? Yes. <laughs> Say more. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, uh, where, where to go first? Uh, I, I think one significant one uh, from the Gospel of Matthew, um, recall that in the opening genealogy uh, in Matthew, Matthew highlights a handful of women in that genealogy. Um, one of them is Rechav from this story, um, a Canaanite woman. And what's interesting about that is later on in Matthew, Matthew chapter 15, he's going to narrate a whole encounter that Jesus has uh, with a woman that he calls the Canaanite woman. In Mark, uh, she's called the Syrophoenician woman, but Matthew uniquely calls her the Canaanite woman. And it's precisely that encounter that he has with a non-Israelite, and he is, depending on how you read that story, either compelled or he compels her to press in more. But he ends up giving the blessing of the family of Abraham that brings healing power to a Canaanite woman, precisely because of that interaction. And that's connects to a whole theme that's littered throughout Matthew that actually began with the Roman centurion when he says, I haven't found anyone within Israel with faith like this Roman centurion and then later uh, the Canaanite woman. So it's a good example um, of how the apostles, um, however you explain how the techniques and skills for how to read and meditate on this literature, how it got passed down uh, from right, the first temple period through the exile into second temple Judaism. The apostles were so in tune with how to read and understand what was happening uh, in, the, in these texts. And that's a, a really good example. Great. So related to that, two questions that work together. How do we responsibly meditate and interpret these hyperlinks within the Bible without imposing our own presuppositions? And then how can we practice these kinds of skills if we don't read Hebrew? Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so uh, what, are, what are the controls in place? Um, one of the, and uh, you know, Andy touched on this um, this morning. Part of what, how this literature works, this is, this is challenging, I think, for those of us who have been shaped in certain corners of Protestantism, um, where there is a high uh, value placed on accuracy of doctrine. And that's a really, really important value. If we are relating to the God of the universe, I at least want to make sure I am growing in right understanding of the person to whom I'm relating. Yeah, so like that's a good thing. And doctrine really matters. But at the same time, the literature, biblical literature itself, that guides us and renders the portrait of that God is a kind of literature that is highly imaginative 
and that as you read through biblical texts, I mean, how Carmen's presentation is such a great example. How many of you read the Bible and are regularly confused? <laughs> right? And so I think because our theological shaping um, rightly wants to point us towards accuracy and right thinking about God, it can make reading biblical literature really frustrating because it's constantly forcing us to ask questions and have no clue what's going on. And so we experience it um, as a glitch in the Bible, like the Bible's not working right, when it's precisely the opposite. It's a feature. It's an intentional feature of these stories to make us confused <laughs> and to make you puzzled and to make you hold multiple possibilities of interpretation open and then keep reading. And it's precisely as you reread and reread through the collection that clarification of earlier puzzles, you find your answers later on. And sometimes it's not after a decade because you yourself are becoming a ninja master of the collection. And like that's how this literature works. So in, in terms of how do we know that we're not um, imposing our own imp whatever ideas onto the text, um, my experience um, has one been learning to internalize the skills related to literary design that I haven't even talked about and so just I'll just say that um, but the other the other thing is every one of these narrative analogies begins in my mind as a possibility and over time I just started to create a little like bullet list or when I have one of these that's what happened with this paper I'd noticed this thing about the the casting of the lots and over the years I just started to notice like oh there's five of these stories and oh they're all riddled with the same vocabulary and then it grows in probability in my mind enough that I'm confident to now get up in front of a group of people and say that I think this is right so that's been my I experience and I don't know any other way to learn except to learn, <laughs> uh, which means that you're not sure, but you keep learning and you become more sure and sometimes less sure of other things, and that is just the process of growth. I didn't even answer the second part, but maybe that's okay. You're welcome to. Go right ahead. I don't remember what it was. Uh, what if What if we don't read Hebrew? Oh, what if you don't read Hebrew? I see skills if yeah. we don't read Hebrew. Yeah, so I didn't know Hebrew when I said So um, reading multiple translations, um, learning how to use a concordance, and especially digital, digital concordances where you can at least find a tool where you can see what are Greek or Hebrew words even transliterated underneath the English words. And even if reading a more literal translation, like the New American Standard, for example, um, where it more consistently uses the same English word for the same Greek or Hebrew words, it usually makes for t bad English, like really terrible English, but a great study Bible. Um, so, you know, don't use it to read it to anybody out loud, but use it to study with because it's a really uh, great way to encounter the text. And that's how I started. And then it was after years of just doing that in English where I just wanted more, lit the fire, uh, that I was motivated enough to learn uh, the original languages myself. And if you have two minutes with Becky Josperger, she'll make sure to convince you as well to take Hebrew here with yep. her at Multnomah <laughs> and says she yep. can teach anyone Hebrew. So, yep. But with the encouragement from Tim, would you thank him for coming today and being our teacher?